several months ago, um, I felt like we needed to jump into the book of James. And we had seen on Sunday nights um, that this book was, I guess you could say that it's very practical, but it kind of goes beyond being very practical. So we're working our way through chapter 1. And kind of the, the overarching theme here is that there's faith that it's in action. And this section that we're in now is talking more about beliefs and how they behave. What does that look like? I've been told years ago that our belief drives our behavior. Whatever it is that you believe, those are the things that you think about. And those are the things that kind of govern what you do. And I may not understand your belief, but it's governed by something. People don't act arbitrarily. Something governs the way we behave. So James presents here a response to trials, a response to temptation, and then what we're looking at now, we're finishing up a response to the truth revealed in God's word. And in verses 19 through 27, he kind of breaks this response to the truth down into two different parts. Last time we looked at a proper reception of the scripture. And this morning we'll look at a proper reaction to the word, reflecting in an obedient life. When we looked at the, the proper reception or how we rightly receive God's word, there were three things that we looked at. A willingness to receive the word with submission. Willingness to receive the word with purity and willingness to receive the word with humility. And as important as it is to receive God's word properly with an attitude of, of submission, we also must react or respond in a proper way to the word of God. And that is through obedience. Obedience is, is it's, it's essential. Obedience is to the word, to God's word, the most basic spiritual requirement. I mean, it's a fundamental that has to occur and will occur when Christ, when, when we see that Christ's death on the cross and we see the work that God does and he imparts his spirit into us, it requires some reaction. The bottom line of true spirituality is not kind of a momentary feeling, but it's an enduring hope an enduring desire to know the word, to be with God's people, to share that with others, to be obedient to the things of the scripture. It's a long-term journey. In John 8, chapter, 30, or chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus tells us, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. We see also in this passage a proper reaction to the word. In James chapter 1, verses 22 to 27, we just read that. As important as it is to have a proper reception of the word without obedience to its truth, there's no benefit. Matter of fact, it's more of a judgment to us if we're not obedient to the word. If we have received the word and we're not willing to be obedient to that, we will not receive blessing. We will receive judgment. It's essential to hear the word with an attitude of submission, but even that is not enough. Those who consistently disobey God's word give evidence that they are without his life in them. And James is so clear of how he marks this out. I'm, this isn't m me telling you this. This is the Holy Spirit through James giving us God's word. Those who consistently obey the word give evidence of God's life in their souls. And this is the central theme that we see throughout James. In chapter 1, verses 22, it says, but prove yourself doers of the word and not merely hearers 
who delude themselves. A true believer will not be inwardly satisfied merely knowing the word. It would almost be like us just saying, I'm not going to get out of bed. I just want you to bring food to me. Well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to eat the food. Well, then what are you going to do? Nothing. I just want you to bring me more food. Well, you're not going to do anything? No, just, just bring me food. We would look at that situation and say, well, that, <laughs> that's probably not going to work out well for you. And James makes this analogy here that we're going to see in a moment, that it's perplexing. He says, how, how can that be? How can we just desire to have food or to be fed and not ever intend on doing or being in this case? A true believer will not be inwardly satisfied with merely knowing the word. His conscious and his prompting of the indwelling Holy Spirit will continue to convict him of his failure until he becomes obedient. If you have committed your life to Christ and you're in the process of being sanctified, of being made to look more like Christ, you know what this feels like. You'll see yourself with your children, or you'll see yourself with a spouse, or you're, you'll see yourself react in a certain way, and you think, oh my goodness, that didn't sound loving. That didn't sound like Christ. That didn't look like Christ. The Holy Spirit will convict. And he'll use all different types of ways to show us that. And it could be through his word being taught or preached. It could be through song. It could be for just in us living day to day and seeing ourselves. I want you to see this quote that we have up here next. The character of men is evidenced primarily by their conduct. Over time, conduct is always a reliable test of the inner person. For inevitably, the true nature of the person will express itself outwardly. And we can look at that and we can say, boy, that's true about you. Because <laughs> I've, I've, I think we just, okay. I've seen that in some of you. I, I've seen you, I've seen that happen. <laughs> but aren't we foolish to think that, that, that you don't see that in me? <laughs> that others don't see that in me? The character of men is evidenced primarily by their conduct. James is going to continue to bring it on, and we've got to be ready. He does this through this whole book. We see in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, he says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. We've got a pear tree out in the backyard. When I, I normally don't get near that tree because I'm not a, a part of that harvesting process, but when I have to mow around that tree, that, there's some fruit that's hanging up there that's, man, it's delicious. And it's soft. And boy, when you bite into it, it just, that pear juice just runs down your face. I mean, it's, they're delicious. If that pear tree started to produce thorns, we would think something was terribly wrong. Matter of fact, inconceivable. There's no way to even imagine what that would look like because that's not a thorn bush. We're reminded in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, for the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure, what is evil. Say, like, why in the world did I say that? Why in the world would I have done just, just done that? Why, why in the world would I treat my spouse this way, knowing that God sent them to me? 
sometimes to encourage me and sometimes to exhort me. But either way, what causes me to do that? My heart. It's deceitfully wicked, and who can know it? We've seen three elements for receiving word, and there are also three elements for us obeying the word. The hearer and doer of the word proves their faith in three ways, and we want to look at those this morning. A proper reaction to God's word results in a willingness first to apply the word without deception. So we see in verse 22, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude or deceive themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having be become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone thinks himself to be religious and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. Professing Christians who hear the word without obeying it make a serious spiritual miscalculation, which causes them to doubt or deceive themselves. They are self-deceived. And in order for us to try to, to, for James to explain that and for us to try to grasp what that means, he gives us an analogy here in verse 23. He says, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he is. The hearer of the word is a doer and a person that carefully observes their own actions, their own activities. The key to this analogy is that a faithful hearer and doer of the word does not study the mirror itself, but the image in the mirror. I don't know about you, but I can look in the mirror today and I see something different than I saw 10 years ago. Namely, I see some more wrinkles. I can't deny that. That's, if I look intently into the mirror, that's what I see. And for me to walk away from that and to think that my image is what it was 10 years ago, is just, it's just foolish. And James is saying that what we see in the mirror, we need to look intently into this mirror. And we can't just walk away and act like it didn't happen. A faithful hearer and doer of the word does not study the mirror itself, but rather what the mirror reveals. When we look at God's word, what is revealed? God's will and his truth. And for me to walk away from seeing that and act like I don't have any recollection of his will or his truth is just as absurd. Following the analogy of the mirror, James in verse 26 presents an application using the tongue. And we're going to spend some more time developing this in chapter 3. If you're familiar at all with the book of James, he kind of um, unloads a preview in chapter 1. And then beginning in chapters 2 and 3 and 4 and 5, 6, he, he, he kind of deals with those things separately. But this is his application for this. If the tongue is not controlled by God it is a sure indicator that the heart is not either. Whew. James doesn't mess around. He's not here for fun and games. 
He's taken all of the wisdom that he's accumulated over the years and he's writing to a group of believers and he's saying, here is the wisdom that I've gained. If the tongue is not controlled by God, it is a sure indicator that the heart is not either. Jesus told the self-righteous Pharisee in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34 and in verse 37, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Religion that does not transform the heart and thereby the tongue is totally worthless in God's sight. Let's look at this next point we see in verse 27, a willingness to apply the word without selfishness. Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our, of, of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress. So here we see a proper reaction to the word. Why would they single out widows and orphans? Well, certainly in this context, in his day and time, if you were a widow or an orphan, the opportunity for you to have work was pretty slim. There weren't any life insurance policies. There wasn't uh, some kind of a federal program to where you could get assistance. That you were on hard times indeed. Those would be the people that would be least likely to be able to reciprocate anything we could do for them. That means you're going into this knowing that whatever you do, you're not going to get anything in return, ever. Sometimes that kind of has a little bit of sway with me. Not necessarily that I look for weighing it out, but just kind of an idea that, well, they'll pay me back. Or if I ever need help, I could call on them. This is giving and helping without any thought of reciprocation. Generally in the early church, orphans and widows were the most in need. Because such people without parents and husbands were unable to reciprocate in any way, caring for them reveals true sacrificial love. This is sharing without, sacri or without selfishness. Are you willing to help someone knowing that they're going to use you? It will happen. Your response to this word will be tested. someone will say something bad about you even though you've gone out of your way to help them. You may offer them a place to stay and they may take something that's yours when they leave. It can happen. It will happen. It happened to our Savior. He told us we can expect it to happen to us. The third application here proper reaction to God's word will result in applying the word without compromise. Reacting to the word and the willingness to apply one's life without moral or spiritual compromise. He uses the word to keep here. This indicates a continuous action. This is part of that concept of abiding in him. To keep indica indicates uh, keeping oneself unstained by the world. It's the perpetual obligation of Christians. Those who belong to God are to be characterized by moral and spiritual purity. So how in the world are we supposed to remain moral and, 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 and pure and at the same time be out in the world living and ministering and loving others? who are not followers of Christ. That's the reason we have this. Here is where we gather with ourselves. Here's where we, we gather with one another and we sing and we're encouraged. And here's where the relationships that I've built with you help me. 
Because if you see me wandering away, you call me to task. Say, brother, I'm concerned. We have to have both. Being in the world but not of the world does not mean that we avoid the world. That's exactly the opposite of what we're commanded to do. How do I remain pure here? By not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. By being in vital union with one another. That can't happen if you see me on Sunday morning only. It just can't. If you're married and you decided that you were going to be with your spouse on Tuesdays, all day Tuesday, you're going to devote the whole day, okay? But you're going to be with them all day Tuesday. What are you going to do the rest of the week? Well, I'm going to be doing my own thing. I got, I got another place where I'm staying. But Tuesday? <laughs> Honey, that's yours. <laughs> that's absurd. You can't live in vital union. You certainly can't live in as one flesh that way. For us to be disciple makers who make other disciples, we have to be living day to day, week in, week out. And it may not happen every single day, but it certainly happens more than once a week. And I've got to devote myself to the same type of commitment to make sure that I'm staying pure, moral and spiritual purity. I have to have, be having conversations with with someone here, with my pastor, with other Sunday school teachers, with people in the Sunday school class, with others that I know, people that I've just developed a, a relationship with. We, we have to be in vital union. Peter admonishes believers in, chap, in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 17 to 19. Consider yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth knowing that you are not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as the blood of the Lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Every Christian falls short. We all do. We all will. And like Paul, we find ourselves saying, those things that I want to do, I find myself not doing, and those things that I don't want to do are the very things that I spend my time doing. What am I supposed to do? Oh, wretched man that I am. Repentance. Faith. James is speaking of a basic orientation of our lives. It's like a central commitment or allegiance. I was reminded of this uh, when our nephew and, and Josue going through and committing themselves to the armed forces. They make a commitment, and it's serious. Becoming a citizen, we saw that recently. That's a serious commitment if you've never read through that. This is the commitment that's birthed in us by God through his Spirit. We've taken a look at some of these things that James lays out for us, but that's not the only thing that Scripture has to say about our reception, our reaction, and our obedience to Scriptures. Several years ago, Donald Whitney wrote a book called Diagnose Your Spiritual Health. There were ten of these things, and I just want to kind of go through these. I've got a handout here that you can, can take one that's got a little bit more information, or if you want to find the book to read the whole book. But he asked some questions. First question, do you thirst for God? Do you meditate on the scriptures? Not merely reading them, but meditating. Do you pray through scripture after you read through a section? This is important. Our thirst for God. The next slide. I've never heard this word before. Read thirst-making writers. <laughs> what in the world is that? These are people that cause you to hunger and thirst for the word, that present this in such a way that you say, I, I need to find out more about that. After the God-breathed words of the Bible read, read the time-tested authors, the Puritan prayers, uh, devotions, collection of devotions, 
called The Valley of Vision. An amazing, humbling read. Puritan prayers, John Bunyan, John Owen. There's just a list here. Thomas Watson, Jonathan Edwards, Spurgeon, A.W. Tozer, Pink, John Piper. There's more that could be added to this list. Second question, are you governed increasingly by God's word? Now here's where this is going to get tough again. Be impacted by God's word. Listen to what he says. Many professing Christians bump along from Sunday to Sunday, year to year, with no recollection of changes in belief or practices as a result of new discoveries in the word. They would tell you that they believe the same as they did years ago. They carry a Bible to church, but they couldn't tell you the last time their daily life was altered by it. They may even be daily Bible readers and have heard one or more sermons per week for years, yet with all their exposure to the Bible, generally its inspired words have left no more imprint on them and their minds than the spoken words do upon the air. It could never be said of them that they deliberately are governed by their, in their daily lives by God's word. Deepen your desire for God's word. Make time for God's word. We all have a battle with prioritization. Next question. Are you more loving? John 13, 34 says, A new commandment that I give you, It's not that you just love one another. That command was already given. Love one another as I have loved you. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Next question. Are you more sensitive to God's presence? How often are you aware of the presence of God? It should not be unusual for us whenever we are to recognize, wherever we are, to recognize that God is here. Next question. Do you have a growing concern for spiritual and temporal needs of others? Christianity is a religion of concern for others. This is part of what sets Christianity apart from everything else in the world. No other religion is known for its love and compassion. Meeting needs is the way of Jesus. Next, do you delight in the bride of Christ? And this isn't necessarily just the individual people that make up the bride. This is the bride collectively. Delighting in Christ's people is normal and healthy. Do you take pleasure in those who bring pleasure to him? Do you find irresistible joy in the presence and ministry of Christ's people? Next question. Are the spiritual disciplines increasingly important to you? These are the ones we've spent several weeks studying these. Bible intake, prayer, worship, evangelism, serving, stewardship, fasting, silence and solitude, journaling, and learning. Are these important to us at all? Next question. Do you still grieve over sin? We are all struggling. Interesting point here. It is not the absence of sin, but the grieving over it which distinguishes the child of God. Isn't that interesting? Two ways to evaluate your life. Proximity to the ideal or progress toward it. He develops all of these thoughts. Next question. Are you a quick a quicker forgiver. I am ready to forgive anybody, anything. True Christians love forgiveness. Why in the world would true Christians love forgiveness? Because we've been forgiven. A great debt. What could you possibly do to me that would some kind of balance out my sin to God? Nothing caused us to so nearly resemble God as the forgiveness of injuries. 
not easy, but possible. Next, do you yearn for heaven and to be with Jesus? Are your thoughts increasingly homeward? Your longings for holiness in heaven pull you toward holiness now. See, this isn't just one of those things that, oh, won't it be good in glory? What are you doing? I'm waiting for the day. I'm ready to go home. Well, what are you doing now? Well, I'm, I'm waiting for the day. I'm ready to go home. That's, that's not the full concept of this. Do you long for holiness in heaven? Does that longing for holiness in heaven pull you toward holiness now? Do you have his hope? Do you have this hope to see the Savior as he is? Difficult questions. We've focused on the response to the truth revealed in God's word two ways, a proper reception of scripture and the proper reaction to the word. So what is your response this morning to the truth that you have seen in God's word? Will you as the man who sees himself in the mirror immediately forget what kind of person he just observed himself to be? Or will you respond with proper reception of the scripture in submission, in purity, in humility? And will you react to the challenge of God's word without deception, without selfishness, and without compromise? How do you walk away from this is the reaction that James is asking about. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful to be able to have time to spend looking through your word and deepening our understanding and allowing you to speak to us. And Father, I pray that we will not walk away and forget. Help us to peer into the scriptures and to see what it says and to allow it to have a, a proper impact in our lives. We don't just thirst for your word because we're thirsty. We thirst for your word so that we can share that with others, that we can invest our lives in others, that we can meet people along the way and be an encouragement to them and point them to the cross. Father, help us to be honest as we look in the mirror and as we walk away. In Jesus' name.